Let me read to you a passage from the fifth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, verses 17 to 37. It's the Gospel for the sixth Sunday in ordinary time year A. St. Matthew writes, Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Anyone who breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be subject to judgment. Again, anyone who says to his brother, Raka, is answerable to the Sanhedrin. But anyone who says, You fool, will be in danger of the fire of hell. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary, who is taking you to court. Do it while you are still with him on the way, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge may hand you over to the officer, and you may be thrown to prison. I tell you the truth, you will not get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It has been said anyone who divorces his wife must give her a writ of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries the divorced woman commits adultery. Again I tell you, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oaths you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your own head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no be no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. That's from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 to 37. What does this suggest to us? Well, our passage today consists of 20 verses from the Sermon on the Mount, which was Matthew's compilation of Christ's teaching at the start of his presentation of the public ministry. It is the law of the gospel promulgated by Jesus Christ on the Mount, reminiscent of the promulgation of the law of God on Mount Sinai over a thousand years before. As our Lord explains, his law fulfills the law of Moses and the prophets. Jeremiah had prophesied that God would establish a new covenant with the house of Israel. I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Jeremiah chapter 31. St. Augustine wrote that the Sermon on the Mount expresses the perfect way of the Christian life, and all the precepts needed to change one, to shape one's life. It sets forth a life that reflects that of Jesus Christ, fulfilling, refining, surpassing, and leading the old law to perfection. The gift of the Holy Spirit 
is at the heart of the way described in our gospel today. And it is the Holy Spirit who can take the Christian beyond normal morality to the exceptional sanctity described in the Sermon on the Mount. It shows in greater detail what it means to imitate Jesus Christ in everyday life. Now what is especially noteworthy about the Sermon on the Mount is the general picture of sanctity that it provides. And history is not short of instances of this superior Christian sanctity in the most unlikely places. Let me nominate one unlikely place where sanctity is not, unusual, is not usually expected, namely in the halls of secular power. We do not expect to see sanctity in those wielding power in the top echelons of civil society. I'm thinking of monarchs, military generals, or those close to them in the work of government. We expect to see there men or women of very mixed motives and less than excellent actions. We could almost regard such a class of persons as a test case of the possibility of the Holy Spirit empowering man to live according to the law of Christ and in a way surpassing the old. There have been saints who were civil rulers. One such was King Louis IX of France from 1214 to 1270, canonized 27 years after his death by Pope Boniface VIII and the only canonized King of France. Consider another example of shining sanctity in the midst of matters military and political. I refer to Joan of Arc. She was called by God to a brief career as a military general, a fighting warrior, a person of the sword, a leader attacking strongholds and restoring a temporal kingship. She was born into a prosperous peasant family and her life was lived in the context of the Hundred Years' War between England and France. She had a notable place in the decline of the English fortunes there, their side. At the age of 13, through the voice of St. Michael the Archangel, Joan felt herself called by the Lord to intensify her Christian life and to act personally to free her people. She made a vow of virginity and redoubled her prayers, participating in sacramental life with renewed energy. She, a young French peasant girl, had singular compassion and commitment in the face of her people's suffering, and this was made even more intense through her mystical relationship with God. God intervened in her life, calling her to union with him, but with this rather original feature. She had from God a political and military mission, and in a sense she could be looked on as an inspiration for those in these spheres of life. Her activities began early in 1429 when she managed to meet with the French Dauphin, the future King Charles VII. He had her examined by theologians of the University of Poitiers, who found her to be a good Christian. On the 22nd of March of that year, 1429, Joan dictated a letter to the King of England and his men, who were laying siege to the city of Orleans. She wanted peace between the two Christian peoples, but the offer was rejected. So she fought for the liberation of the city. A culminating moment of her work came in July 1429, when King Charles was crowned in Reims. The following year, she fell into the hands of her enemies at Compagne and was taken to the city of Rouen. And there, after a long trial, she was condemned to death on the 30th of May, 1431. She died burning at the stake during her 20th year, holding the crucifix and calling on the name of Jesus. She was a magnificent example of one loving and serving Christ in a political and military setting. She ended her short life in the most horrible fashion, but resolutely in the, in the arms of Jesus Christ and a Christian warrior to the end. In our Gospel today, our Lord says that he had come to fulfill the law and the prophets. The sanctity he offers, that he offers as our Redeemer, is one that surpasses ordinary morality. He has given to us the gift that makes this possible, the gift that is the Holy Spirit. 
but it means that we must work at our union with Jesus Christ, making him and his love the soul of all that we do, no matter what our calling in life may be. It has been said that the present age is the age of the laity. This must mean especially the call on the laity to bring Jesus Christ and his love to every secular setting, even the most unlikely. Louis of France and Joan of Arc may provide us with example and inspiration in this. Let us follow their example in our modern day, a day that is so very secular.